Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 38. The Wrath of Woden. May you be consumed as coal upon the hearth, May you shrink as dung upon a wall, and may you dry up as water in a pail. May you become as small as a linseed grain, and much smaller than the hip bone of an itch mite. And may you become so small that you become nothing. An excerpt from an Anglo-Saxon curse. Welcome back to the History of Witchcraft. Last week, we considered the early centuries of Christian Rome, the tales and legends of the apostles that were spread far and wide, and how they influenced post-pagan law codes regarding sorcery. Of course, while the Roman Empire continued to flourish in the eastern half for centuries, the Western Empire collapsed, and its former territories came to be ruled by independent kings hailing from beyond the borders of the empire. Gaul was ruled by the Franks, Iberia by the Visigoths, northern Italy by the Ostrogoths, and later the Lombards, and Britannia gained a ruling caste of Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, who formed what became known as Anglo-Saxon Britain. These Anglo-Saxons, and their understanding of magic and those that cast it, will be the subject of this episode. The historical narrative of the end of Roman Britain and the arrival of the barbarians is somewhat controversial. Arguments range from a full-scale invasion and extermination of the native Britons, with the only remnants surviving in Cornwall, Wales, and the region of Brittany, to simply an overthrow of existing Breton rulers with Anglo-Saxons, while the general population was relatively untouched. Both cases are supported by the archaeological record to some degree, with traditional Romano-British customs seemingly disappearing rapidly after the arrival of the Germans, but I find myself in agreement with the History of England's David Crowther, who rightly points out that if a bunch of heavily armed and violent pagans turned up, killed my local magistrate, and said they were going to stay, I would probably see the sense in appearing as similar to the newcomers as possible, especially as hopes of a Roman legion arriving to evict the trespassers faded with time. Either way, Anglo-Saxon Britain is thought to have lasted from around 450 CE until the Norman invasion in 1066. After the coming of the various Germanic tribes, which are either a tidal wave of bloodshed or a top-down integration and absorption, depending on your view, the new arrivals established numerous small kingdoms and territories all across the island of Britain. This time is wrapped in myth, with legendary figures leading their people and expanding their territory until the patchwork of realms roughly numbered seven, the Heptarchy, which consisted of, from southeast to northwest, the kingdoms of Kent, Sussex, Wessex, Essex, Mercia, East Anglia, and Northumbria. These kingdoms varied in size and strength, and over the centuries different kings would hold authority over all of their neighbours, becoming the Brettonwalder, although such hegemony would usually collapse either during the ruler's lifetime or shortly after his death. These larger kingdoms were hierarchical, but an upcoming thesis by Daniel Cutts suggests that the nobles within these hierarchies were treated more as underkings or kingtains rather than chiefs or chieftains under a single king. It was over this period that the formerly pagan rulers of Britain converted to the Christian faith. Steadily, the smaller kingdoms were consumed until only the big four, that is to say, Wessex, Mercia, East Anglia and Northumbria, remained independent of any other king, when the Northmen came a Viking. It was the pagans from across the sea, echoing the Anglo-Saxons' arrival centuries earlier, that changed the balance of power in what would become England. After decades of raiding and invasion, roughly half of the country would be held by Scandinavians, and would become known as the Danelaw, the regions where Scandinavian law and custom held sway, even after the kingdom was united under Anglo-Saxon kings. This was an incredible reversal of fortune, 
as Saxon rule in England was almost snuffed out during the reign of Alfred the Great of Wessex, who managed to fend off the Danes, improve his kingdom's defences, and begin a reconquest, a process that was continued and completed under the rule of his descendants. For the period between the end of Roman rule and the Battle of Hastings, I'm going to refer to the people of future England as Anglo-Saxons, although I'm well aware that there are important differences between the Jutes, Angles, Saxons, Danes, Welsh, Norwegians, Franks, Cornish, Swedes, and Frisians who populated this green and pleasant land, but our sources are so limited that I wouldn't be able to discuss each culture independently, plus it would just get confusing. Regarding these sources, the vast majority of them come from Christian writers, as it was the monasteries, churches, and clergy that most often had the ability to read and write, as well as the time to record the myths, legal codes, and hearsay that make up our sources. Naturally, this will give us an impression that Anglo-Saxon society was strictly Christian, but that's not the case necessarily. During the conversion of the people of Kent to Christianity, Pope Gregory the Great was in favour of adapting existing pagan traditions into Christian worship, with the eventual aim that the pagan aspects would be discarded once the religion was established. This led to a strange hybrid of Christianity and paganism, where traditionally Germanic events and festivals were still held, but any religious acts would be conducted for the glory of the Christian god, rather than Woden or Thuno. Additionally, the subjects of a Christian lord were encouraged to incorporate Christian traditions into daily life. Previously, pagan charms and chants, called Galdor in Old English, that were meant to ward off evil and protect the caster from the effects of witchcraft, were replaced with the Lord's Prayer, a short Christian prayer that was taught in the Old English language rather than the usual Latin, meaning that it could be quickly recited whenever supernatural support was needed, but a priest wasn't around. Still, Anglo-Saxon traditions remained, such as the Nine Herbs charm that incorporated both Christian and pagan themes into it, beseeching both Jesus and Woden, as it sought to heal the ailments caused by poisoning and sorcery. Pagan spirits, both good and evil, took on new forms as either angels or demons depending on their actions, and charms and potions that once were used to drive out evil elves or dwarves, who the Anglo-Saxons believed were sickness-bringing spirits, now repelled the evil acts of the devil. Through this hybrid Christian-pagan approach to conversion, as well as strong political and financial support from the papacy, the kings and kingtains of England would be majority Christians by the end of the 7th century, despite a heavy dose of heathenism that would make a nun blush. The clergy would found a network of abbeys and monasteries throughout the land, which became both a tool of communication and rule for secular lords, as well as becoming the authors of many of our sources. Of course, we have no idea how devout these new converts truly were, since there were plenty of political reasons for a ruler to proclaim his conversion, and likewise, there is no accurate information on the beliefs of the general populace. Some would undoubtedly be ardent Christians, just as some would be stridently pagan, whereas others may have worshipped Thunor and Woden, and simply added the nailed god of Christ to the pantheon of deities. Culturally, the Anglo-Saxons would keep to their traditional beliefs and customs, and it was in these folkloric tales, recorded through a Christian lens, that provide us with our understanding of Anglo-Saxon witchcraft. Naturally, this means that our understanding is both incomplete, and that those pieces of information we do have are unavoidably influenced by the desires and opinions of their recorders. The earliest reference in Christian writings to witchcraft in the lands of the Anglo-Saxons appears in stories detailing the first Gregorian mission to convert the King of Kent. According to Bede, the Venerable, writer of the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, when Augustine, sent by Pope Gregory to Kent, meets with King Aethelbert of Kent. Aethelbert, despite being a pleasant host by all accounts, initially insists on meeting with the Christians in an open courtyard rather than his hall. Since it was customary for guests to be greeted inside a lord's hall, the reason given for this unusual breach in protocol is that the Anglo-Saxons believed that priests, both of their own religion and of others, had magical powers, and that these powers are less effective in the open air. 
Bede asserts that because the Christians came carrying banners of the cross and singing holy litanies, they were, quote, endowed with divine, not devilish, power, end quote. And so Ethelbert was convinced and joyfully converted from his filthy pagan practices. See what I mean about our sources being somewhat zealous? The idea that pagan priests consorted with devils and held the power of witchcraft at their fingertips is shown again in the tale of St. Wilfred. Wilfred, on a sea journey to Northumbria, was blown ashore in Sussex. Sussex was a brutal and unforgiving place, much like it is today, but unlike modern Sussex, the South Saxons that greeted Wilfred were still pagan, and so the greeting that Wilfred and his retinue received was largely bloodthirsty in nature. These natives were led by their priest, who stood on a nearby hill and chanted magical spells in an effort to bind the Christians and assist his followers as they attacked the party. Luckily for Wilfred, one of his retinue, for he was known to travel in style with dozens of companions, was a very good shot with a sling, and after the stone was quite horridly blessed by a priest, the man felled the Princeps Sacerdotum Idolatriae with a single shot to the head. With their leader slain, the natives lost all heart and retreated, and the saint was able to sail away, never to return to that terrible, horrifying place that is Sussex. The Latin term that I just used, and probably mispronounced, Princeps Sacerdotum Idolatriae, was used interchangeably with Idolatris Pontificus by Christian writers, to mean the High Priest of Idolatry, or the Priests of the Old Saxon Faith. These priests were known by the authors of our sources to consort with demons, and use this relationship with the supernatural to work malevolent acts upon the good Christian people of Britain. It is here that we can see the similarities with the later medieval and early modern beliefs in pacts with the devil and secret covens of witches sacrificing to the Prince of Darkness. The term Galdor was used to describe charms and incantations that could be both protective and malevolent in nature, as we discussed earlier, and its users were called Galdre, or Galdrikig, depending on whether they were male or female. Another term used was Wicca, or Wiccacraft, which we of course get the modern English term witchcraft, as well as the name used by the modern Wicca movement. Both terms seem to have been used relatively interchangeably, but it is possible that both Galdercraft and Wiccacraft had different cultural meanings that have been lost to time. After Christianity had taken root in England, towards the end of the 7th century, the church became much more open in its condemnation of those who practiced magic, or those that consulted witches or auguries for advice. A number of penitentials, documents providing advice and guidance for the clergy, are recorded listing the punishments they recommend for various sins, including witchcraft. The earliest that deals specifically with witchcraft is the Penitential Theodori, authored by Theodore of Tarsus, Archbishop of Canterbury, around the turn of the 8th century. The section of interest to us, concerning the worship of idols, is as follows. If a woman has performed incantations, or diabolical divinations, let her do penance for one year. About which it says in the canon, those who observe auguries, or auspices, or dreams, or any kind of divinations according to the customs of the heathens, or introduce men of this kind into their homes in investigating a device of the magicians, if these repent, if they are of the clergy, let them be cast out. But... If they are truly secular people, let them do penance for five years. What is interesting here is that Theodore specifically equates devilish dealings to women, while those who seek out knowledge on the future appear to be from all walks of life, both clergy and laymen. Additionally, a key term within this penitential is according to the customs of the heathens. Like with the tale of Augustine, Christian writers see a clear difference between the rituals of the church and the rituals of the pagans. Any power or knowledge gained from pagan sources must be from the devil, whereas a Christian prayer, which is itself the recitation of words with the intention of affecting the world, is powered by the divine. A later penitential written by the Archbishop of York, Eckbert, dating from midway through the 8th century, singles out women and states that, quote, 
If a woman acts with wizardry, enchantment or drugs, and succeeds, let her fast for twelve months. At this stage, these are just pieces of advice written by particular bishops for use by the clergy, and while the church did have their own courts and a certain amount of legal authority, it is unclear how ironclad and enforceable these punishments would have actually been. However, as we've seen with most societies that believed in the power of magic, laws were enacted to attempt to curb and control the prevalence of these dangerous, and later heretical, pursuits. Alfred the Great, arguably architect of a united England, was a notably devout king in an era of devout kings. While he did not display his faith in such a sacrificial manner as Edmund of East Anglia, what with Vikings and arrows and such, he did integrate his strongly held beliefs into the laws that were enacted during his reign. The Dom Book, or Judgment Book, which is not to be confused with the Doomsday Book of Billy the Conk, was a collection of the most just of previous Anglo-Saxon law codes, as well as Alfred's own creations. In the opening introduction of his law codes, Alfred paraphrases from the Old Testament of the Bible. Do not allow the women who are accustomed to receive enchanters, magicians, and witches to live. A little bit more long-winded than do not suffer a witch to live, and oddly specific in that it is not a law against witchcraft, but against women consorting with witchcraft. Audrey Meany, a noted historian and archaeologist, suggested that the Anglo-Saxon view of witches were of women seeking abnormal methods to manage their responsibilities of family and home. If their child was dying from an illness, is it any wonder that a mother would attempt to save them through consorting with the old gods of her ancestors? Similarly, the act of abortion was itself considered an act of witchcraft through the use of potions and poisons, and so, here too, we see an act heavily centred around women's behaviour being criminalised as wickercraft. Interestingly, this is in contrast to the previous Roman depictions, as well as the later English depictions, of witches being old hags or wrinkled spinsters. Those Anglo-Saxons accused of being witches were often young, family oriented women. Meany suggests that, the devout man that he was, Alfred may have been convinced by the penitentials of Theodore and Egbert. They may have only been intended for circulation among the clergy, but Alfred the Great had the means and motivation to read them. Alfred's code explicitly lists three types of magical act that were to be avoided on pain of death. Two we have spoken of before, Galdor and Wicca, but he also specifies Skin Laker, which can be translated to, among other things, a necromancer, an illusionist, or a sorcerer. Alfred's intention by going into such detail can be taken as anyone consorting with devils, demons, poisons, spells, or enchantments should be best avoided. By virtue of being an established royal law, Alfred brought the power of the state to bear against any who were suspected of being one of these individuals. Curiously, the letter of the law did not condemn the actual practitioners of Galdor, Wicca, or Skinlaker. Rather, it punished the women that sought their help. However, in an agreement between Alfred and the newly converted Dane, Gothram, King of East Anglia, they both agree that in the cases of witches or diviners that are in each other's lands, they are to be, quote, driven from the country and the people cleansed, or let them totally perish within the country unless they desist." End quote. Here, Alfred is approving the exile or execution of those who would practice Maleficus, so perhaps the lack of this in his Dom book is due to it being covered in the treaty. After Alfred, his grandson Athelstan was the next Anglo-Saxon king to implement widespread legal reforms, as well as becoming the first king of United England after conquering York, if that's some sort of big deal. Athelstan follows his grandfather in explicitly referring to witchcraft as a criminal offence, with the punishment for witchcraft that leads to someone's death being execution if they do not deny it. If they do deny it, they were to carry three pounds of heated iron for a set distance, spend 120 days in prison, pay the king 120 shillings, as well as the wergild or blood money, to the family of their victim, as well as swearing to never again commit witchcraft. That's if they deny it. It was a Danish king, Canute the Great, that makes the latest legal mention of witchcraft that I can find prior to the Norman Conquest. Canute, 
famous for the story of standing on a beach and demanding the tide recede, an act probably meant to demonstrate to his courtiers that his power was nothing compared to God, but is frequently depicted as Canute genuinely attempting to control the sea, an act of vanity and delusion. Canute lists witchcraft as a crime similar in severity to murder, incest, kinslaying, and adultery, all of which are punished by excommunication from the church and outlawry in England. The term outlaw originally meant someone stripped of their legal protections, able to be robbed and murdered at will without any repercussions, and forbidding anyone from assisting them. Excommunication was intended to sever the individual's access to communion and confession. The two combined was essentially a death sentence with an eternity of damnation to follow. There are five notable examples of Anglo-Saxon witches, helpfully singled out by Professor Anthony Davies, that are either recorded prior to the Norman Conquest or were written post-conquest, but dealing with events that occurred before William made the first and arguably most dangerous part of his conquest, his arrival in Pevensey, Sussex, which, as I've said before, is an awful, awful place. I'm really sorry, Sussex. I don't know why I'm being so mean. First, there's the Witch of Aylesworth. According to charters listing a movement of land in 948 CE, a woman, and possibly her son, were executed for the crime of witchcraft, with the family lands in Aylesworth, Cambridgeshire, being seized by the local bishop, Aethelwald, and traded to a local man, Wolfston. I say, and possibly her son, because some sources disagree on precisely who was found guilty. According to Davies, the woman was accused of attempting to murder a man by stabbing an effigy with pins, a method we have seen previously on our episodes on the ancient and classical world, as well as in early modern England. The woman, and possibly her son, were the victim of a lynch mob that drowned her, and possibly him, with their property being confiscated by the local church. Of course, with over a thousand years of distance between now and then, as well as the, shall we say, inconsistency of mob justice, it is impossible to say whether the Witch of Aylesworth was genuinely trying to practice magical arts. The next is the Witch of Ramsey named as such due to the fact that our knowledge of her comes from the records of the Abbey of Ramsey, Cambridgeshire. This case actually involves two women, one being the classic evil stepmother you'd most often find in a fairy tale, with the other being the actual Maleficus herself. The stepmother approaches the witch to request a potion that will make her husband lose his emotional attachment to his son, her stepson, possibly with the intention of leaving the boy out in the woods, or making him clean the fireplace and scrub the floors. Alas, we do not know whether this attempt was successful, or if the two women met suitably ironic ends. Since this is recorded in church documents, I'm going to make the assumption that things did not go well for the evil stepmother. Since we're talking about fairy tale tropes, how could I miss the opportunity to discuss an evil queen, who doubles down in the game of stereotypes by also being a stepmother? Sorry to all stepmothers listening, I'm sure you're all lovely people that have been cruelly victimised by the fairy tale writing community. I speak, of course, about Queen Elthrith, second or third wife of King Edgar the Peaceful, who, after her husband died and her stepson Edward ascended the throne, promptly had the stepson murdered at Corfe Castle in 978 CE, so that her own son, Ethelred, could take his place. Now, obviously this is not a nice thing to do, not a nice thing at all, although I suppose this technically means that she was no longer a stepmother, so there is that. Her reputation plummeted as her former stepsons climbed, as he gained the title of the Martyr, and in the 12th century monastic history, Liber Eliensis, she is accused of being a witch. This is more than likely nonsense. Besides the fact that this claim was written over a century after the woman died, Althrif was a great supporter of the church. When she became Edgar's queen, she took on the mantle of protector of the faith, and took an active role in the administration of several nunneries and abbeys, as well as founding her own in 986, where she would later be buried. These are hardly the actions of a woman who made pacts with pagan spirits or the devil, especially when one considers that many of those that turned to supernatural aid did so due to experiencing a lack of control in their everyday lives. Elthrif was first a queen, then a queen dowager, with wealth, status, and power. 
she had a king murdered and faced no repercussions. Why on earth would she need assistance from demonic forces when she had all the legitimate power she could ask for? William of Malmesbury was a monk that lived in the 12th century, as well as being the author of some of the most thorough accounts of English history since Bede. In his Histories of the Kings of England, he makes a diversion from a discussion of the death of Pope Gregory VI to provide details of the death of a woman from Berkeley in Gloucestershire in England. The woman was known to be, quote, well-versed in witchcraft, who was not ignorant of ancient auguries, a patroness of gluttony, and an arbiter of lasciviousness who set no limit to her debauches, end quote. So clearly William was not a fan. The account states that the woman had a pet jackdaw who, by making a louder ruckus than usual, predicted that her entire family had been killed in a vague yet lethal way. Her feathered fortune teller was soon proven correct, as a merchant arrived and informed her that, indeed, her family had fallen victim to the vague yet lethal lethality. Stricken by this news, the woman was laid low by a vague yet fatal illness, and realising that her end was upon her, she summoned her two surviving children that had somehow been spared the deadly vagueness that was picking off her bloodline with such glee. The son and the daughter had, despite their mother's apparent wickedness, both entered the service of the church, with one becoming a monk and the other a nun. The woman was concerned that her wickedness was too great for her to be buried in the usual manner, as the very earth itself would be, quote, loath to accept me and caress me to its bosom. As such, specific instructions were given to her surviving children on what to do with her body. Firstly, her corpse would be sewn into a bag made from the skin of a stag, with the bag then being laid in a stone coffin sealed with lead and iron bars. Then another stone, wrapped in three iron chains, was to be laid on top of the coffin. Along with these physical restraints, the woman requested that mass would be held for her for 50 days, and psalms sung for 50 nights and for the first three nights, the sealed coffin must be held in the church before being buried on the fourth night. The story goes that the son and daughter being the best kids of the whole 11th century, they actually arranged for all of these requirements to be met. The coffin, the chains, the multiple shifts of priests that would need to sing for 50 days and nights, the whole shebang. As instructed, the coffin remained in the church at first. On the first night, Demons attacked the church, desperate to drag the woman to hell, but only managed to damage the door before retreating. On the second, they broke in, but could not remove the chains. It was on the third night that the devil himself arrived, ready to claim the soul of the woman, for she had bargained with the enemy of mankind for her abilities, and he was here for his prize. With arrogant ease, the devil tore through the chains like paper, seized the woman from her coffin and attached her to a black horse, festooned with hooks. As they rode into the sunrise and back to hell, the woman's screams of terror floated back to the priests, who could only watch in horror at the events unfolding in front of them. And perhaps feeling a little bit of relief that they don't have to sing psalms for another 46 nights. Now, I'm sure you'll agree, that is a brilliant tale. Although it's let's say, unlikely to have occurred at all, it does provide us with two themes that will be recurring in the future. Firstly, the jackdaw that warned of the vague yet lethal lethality. In late medieval and early modern Europe, as we've seen, those accused of witchcraft were believed, especially in England, to have had an animal companion, a familiar, that assisted them in their acts of villainy and magic. This animal was nothing of the sort, but rather a demon in disguise, given to the witch by the devil during their pact. That, by the way, is the other theme, the idea that the powers of witchcraft were provided through a deal with the devil, that the witch would offer their immortal soul in a bargain with hell in return for earthly power. All in all, William of Malmesbury's account is meant as a warning, a medieval horror story of the fate awaiting those that peddled in sorcery. Neither stone, nor iron, or even the divine power of a choir of priests could save you from your damnation. The final case of witchcraft is actually set after the Norman Conquest. 
Now, before you get up in arms and cry, this is meant to be about Anglo-Saxons on your morning commute, or at your ironing, or wherever it is I'm talking to you, this is about Anglo-Saxons. Found in a history of Hereward the Wake, a famous Anglo-Saxon rebel that fought against William the Conqueror, it deals with his uprising in East Anglia in 1070. Hereward had holed himself and his small army up on the Isle of Ely, an island surrounded by the marshlands of the Fens, an easily defensible position that even with superior numbers, William was struggling to take. While considering making a deal with the rebels, one of his advisers suggested he make use of the services of a local woman, quote, who by her art alone would crush all the courage in the defence of the rebels and drive them in terror from the island, end quote. The king agreed, and the next week the Norman army advanced on the island, while the woman in question was stationed in the midst of the assault to perform her magic. Magic in battle is nothing new in fiction, which this record almost certainly is, by the way. Whether it's Gandalf warding away the Nazgul in The Return of the King, or Bayaz, first of the Magi, tearing a hundred eaters apart in the first law. What occurred in the assault on Ely is nothing of the sort. The unnamed author states that the witch's battle magic consisted of chanting incantations against the rebels before exposing her bare buttocks three times. This potent magical ritual complete, she then fell over and broke her neck, and the Normans retreated. While the author of this account claims to have received this information from witnesses of the battle, it's very unlikely. It would have been highly risky for King William, whose claim to the English throne had been supported by the Pope, who relied on the support of the clergy to maintain his rule, and was individually known to be incredibly pious to have called upon the services of a known witch. The rebellion on the Isle of Ely is known to have happened, and is corroborated by other sources, but it is unlikely to have involved a bare-bottomed old woman in any strategic capacity. That is where we'll leave off today. Next week, we return to the European continent to look at the conversion of Western Europe to Christianity in a post-Roman world. I should say that if you're looking for something to listen to in between episodes of the History of Witchcraft, then you are in for a treat. I've compiled a list of 37 history podcasts that I consider to hold a high quality of research, production quality, and entertainment. Of course, there are the classics on there, the history of Rome, hardcore history, the history of England, and what have you, but I've also included a few shows that you might not have heard of. If you've enjoyed today's episode, I would recommend the history of Vikings. Noah is a fountain of knowledge on Scandinavian society. You can find a link to this list on Podjaster, on my Twitter and Facebook page, or, if you're listening to this on release, it is currently trending on the Podjaster website. Go have a look. As always, thank you to my patrons, the Hammer of the Witches executed today, Witchfinder General Michelle G, my Inquisitors Elaine D, Trish G, and Jean B, and all of my demonologists and theologians. They're all fantastic people, and you can join their ranks by going to patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. Besides supporting the podcast and me financially, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. You can always drop me an email at witchcraftpodcast at gmail.com or message me on Twitter or on the Facebook page at Hist of Witch and the History of Witchcraft Podcast, respectively. The intro and outro music have been provided by Sounds Like an Earful. Thank you again for listening. <laughs>